Hi everybody, I'm Pastor Chris Mays from New Life Fellowship, and I just want to say welcome. Thank you for joining us for session five of Exploring Our Differences. Uh, during this class, we've been looking at what some of the major differences are between Catholicism and Protestantism. And as always, I just want to encourage you to take some notes, write some things down, study for yourself. And if you have any questions or comments, please email me at the address below. I'd be happy to respond and even maybe work something into a future session. Uh, but for this session, I want to get into looking at a couple things that Jesus wanted the church to continue to do after he left. Uh, we all know after the resurrection, uh, Jesus walked with his disciples, told them about the kingdom of God, gave them some commands they needed to do, and then he went back to heaven. He ascended into the clouds, and uh, there were several things that reading through scripture, we can get an idea. Jesus wanted us to do these things after he returned to heaven. Uh, within the Catholic Church, they would commonly call them sacraments. Uh, the Catholic Church recognizes seven sacraments and uh, really ties them into a way that church members would receive actual graces in their lives to uh, continue walking out their salvation. Uh, in the Catholic Church, the seven sacraments uh, include baptism, confirmation. Uh, when we say confirmation in the Catholic Church, they look at it as a laying on of hands to receive the gifts or the seal of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Eucharist or communion. Uh, extreme unction or last rites. When you're about to die, they will come and lay hands on you and pray for you. Uh, another sacrament is penance or what we would say uh, going to confession. They would go and confess their sins and the priest would tell them what they need to do to as penance for their sins. Uh, holy orders is another sacrament, which is when in the Catholic Church you are you are ordained to serve as a deacon, a priest, or a bishop that is taking holy orders, and the church considers that a sacrament. And the last sacrament is marriage, uh, and the church looks at that as a sacrament because it's uh, affirming the union between Jesus and his bride, the church, and it's modeling that. Most Protestants would only recognize two of those things as being commanded by Jesus to continue to do them. And instead of sacraments, we would simply call them observances. Uh, Protestants would not see those things as being tied to receiving additional grace from God to walk out our salvation, uh, but they would see those things as observances that we do uh, to model a, a Christian life and to do the things that Jesus uh, instructed us to do. And uh, the observances that Protestants would recognize as being commands by Jesus continue to do these things uh, would be baptism and communion. Uh, almost every denomination, a Protestant or Catholic, but every denomination concludes some version of baptism and communion in their, whether it's in their liturgy, in their church service, the order of what they do, or just in the calendar and the ongoing life of the church. Uh, the first thing that almost every Protestant church observes is water baptism. Uh, they would recognize the call to do this as being taken from what's commonly referred to as the Great Commission in Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Uh, so they, Protestants, would look at that verse and say, Look, Jesus commanded us to make disciples of all nations, and part of doing that is including water baptism, to baptize them. Uh, the Catholic Church would see water baptism as washing away original sin and receiving your saving grace at that time. Uh, they perform that sacrament for infants. Uh, and, and when they do that for an infant, they're viewing it as this is saving them until they get to the age of confirmation where they can profess the faith that someone else professed for them as an infant. Uh, that is the concept of being a godparent and standing in on behalf of that infant saying, I'm professing faith on their behalf until they're old enough to profess it themselves and be confirmed. Uh, there are some Protestant denominations that do practice infant baptism, but most Protestant denominations uh, would see a pattern in scripture of people being able to repent before they are baptized. And when I say repent, they are able to express their own faith and make an affirmation of, I believe and I'm a follower of Jesus. Uh, they would see that taken from the day of Pentecost. 
uh, when Peter got up and preached this great sermon and 3,000 people got saved, they asked Peter, what should we do to be saved? And he said, repent and be baptized. There was a repentance that happened before baptism. Uh, so most Protestants would say, hey, we don't baptize infants because they can't profess the faith on their own. Uh, we would do it after someone is old enough to profess their own faith. At New Life Fellowship, uh, we believe that water baptism by immersion is the pattern that we see in scripture and it should be done for those who have already expressed their faith. Uh, depending on what denomination or what church you go to, you may see uh, different forms of baptism, uh, whether it's sprinkling or pouring or immersing. Uh, we do it by immersion because the Greek word for baptism that you see in scripture is the word baptizo, which means to fully immerse or submerge. It never was interpreted as to sprinkle or to pour. Uh, every time in scripture when you see someone receive water baptism, it's somebody who believes and they go down into the water to get immersed and then they come up out of the water. Uh, we would encourage those. If you are coming from a Catholic background into a Protestant format, if you've come to New Life Fellowship from a Catholic background, uh, we would encourage you to still take the step of being baptized by immersion as an affirmation of the baptism that you received as an infant. Uh, there is something about as an adult now when you own your faith and it's important to you and, and taking that step to declare, look everyone, I am a follower of Jesus. I'm being baptized. I'm following his commands. Uh, I don't think uh, you should look at it as a, hey, that, that baptism didn't count or my faith beforehand hasn't counted. Uh, but baptism, Baptism by immersion could be viewed as an affirmation of the fact that you were sprinkled or baptized as an infant. Uh, it's not getting saved again, but it is an ownership of your faith and letting people know I am a follower of Jesus. Uh, that's all I want to touch on water baptism right now because I did a whole other video on it. Uh, for more information on what we believe about water baptism, a little more in-depth look at it, uh, check out our What We Believe playlist on YouTube. Uh, session four on that playlist gets into all the ins and outs of water baptism, the details about what we believe. Uh, so that's water baptism is one observance that Protestants would do, that Catholics would call a sacrament, but we would simply call it an observance. The second observance that almost every Protestant denomination does is some form of communion. You may hear that referred to as the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table, uh, but communion is when we receive the elements, the bread and the wine or the fruit of the vine. Some Most churches today use grape juice, uh, but when we receive those elements and remember the Lord, that's called communion or the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. Uh, so a little history from scripture of how communion came about. Uh, Jesus was teaching a large crowd one time. He'd been gathering a whole bunch of followers. And in John 6, verse 48, Jesus says this, Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer to the world so that they may live, is my flesh. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. In hindsight, we know that Jesus was alluding to communion when he made that statement to the crowd that day. But the Jewish people who were listening, uh, they got upset. They took him literally. And for a Jewish person in that time, in that culture, drinking blood or eating meat with the blood still in it was unthinkable to religious Jews. Uh, that would have been a horrible thing for them, violating several commands. Uh, they got so upset when Jesus made these statements that the crowd left him. It says many who had been his disciples turned back and didn't follow him after that. So Jesus making that statement about eating his flesh and drinking his blood 
they took it naturally and they began to leave him. In fact, so many of them left and so many got upset that Jesus even turned around to his 12 disciples and said, how about you guys? Are you going to leave me too now? And uh, Peter, thank God, he wisely spoke up and said, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. He knew enough, Jesus, I don't understand everything you're saying right now, but I know it's truth and it causes something to come alive in me. We're not going anywhere. Uh, so Peter made that statement. The 12 disciples stayed with him. But Jesus said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. Some belief systems would say, look, Jesus made that statement. That means you have to receive communion to be saved. You, you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. You have to do that. Come on. Just like we said about baptism, if you have to receive communion to be saved, that's adding works to salvation. And we know that salvation is strictly by grace. It's not based on works so that no one can boast. We read that verse a couple weeks ago. Uh, the thief on the cross didn't get baptized or have communion. And Jesus looked at him and said, this day, today, right after we die, you're going to be with me in paradise. Uh, so we don't add works to it, but there is something important about communion that we're going to look at in this session. Uh, Jesus continued on in explaining his, to his disciples in John 6, 63, that he had just had that whole conversation where people took him literally. This guy's talking about eating his body and drinking his blood. This is weird. We're out of here. Jesus continued when he was talking to his 12 disciples and said, the words that I have spoken to you are spiritual. They are life. Jesus wasn't talking about literally eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He was talking about spiritual realities that are accessed by doing things in faith. He said, these words that I've been telling you, they're spiritual concepts. I wasn't talking about natural things. I'm talking about spiritual things because that's where the real source of life for us is. And then uh, Jesus eventually made it explicitly clear to his disciples what he had talked about uh, to the crowd that day on the hillside. In Luke 22, they're sitting around a table and it says this in verse 19 of Luke 22, he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So Jesus, what he had inferred or what he had talked about on the hillside that day about his flesh and blood, now sitting with his disciples, he makes it clear, this is what I was referring to. Uh, this occurred at what is typically called to or referred to as the Last Supper. It's called the Last Supper because this is the last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples before he went to the cross. The last time they were sitting around the table eating together before he was crucified. And he used the bread and the wine at that meal to represent his body and blood. Hey, those, those things I was talking about on the hillside that were spiritual, I'm going to model this for you and show you what I was talking about. We continue to do this as an, as an observance because Jesus said, do this to remember me. Think about that. If you had a good friend that is no longer with us, if they passed away, uh, there are some things that you probably do that remind you about what a great friend they were. Things, places you go or pictures you look at, things you experience that it makes you remember that person and it puts a smile on your face. It makes you long to be in their presence. Whatever it is, there are things that we do to remember people. And this is what Jesus was saying. Every time you do this, it should stir that in your heart, that longing, that remembering, that joy that sparked or that ache that says, I want to be with whatever it is. These things, when you do them, it should cause you to remember me. And <clears throat> foundational to everything else, that's why we do communion. It's to remember our friend, our Savior, the one that gave his life for us. We remember him every time we receive communion. Uh, and then just as Jesus said that he was talking about spiritual realities, he was using this meal to demonstrate a spiritual reality to them. Hey, this is what I was talking about. The meal they were eating together was called the Passover. 
This wasn't just any regular dinner. This wasn't a, a, a Tuesday night pizza night. This was a special meal for the Jews called the Passover celebration that they did uh, to remember and celebrate being set free from the bondage in Egypt when they had been slaves. The main focus of that Passover meal, the main focus of that celebration was the Passover lamb that was killed for a sacrifice for them to eat during the Passover meal. And Jesus was declaring to them, hey, a relationship with God is no longer based on the death of a literal lamb. The freedom from bondage is no longer based on killing an actual animal, but Jesus was declaring, it's about me. I am the Passover lamb. When Jesus was doing this at the Passover meal, taking the bread and wine and saying, hey, and now it's a spiritual reality and it's about me setting you free from sin and bondage. Uh, this was first declared and it would have reminded the disciples of what John the Baptist said one day when he saw Jesus. Uh, Jesus was coming towards him in John 1 29 says the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. During that Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus was affirming that he was the lamb, that he had come to take away the sin of the world. And the natural traditions, the natural things that they did as traditions in this meal, they were all pictures pointing towards Jesus and his sacrifice. Uh, a little bit of history of that Passover meal, there were four cups of wine that the participants drank during the Passover meal. Uh, you can go back later, read Exodus 6, verse 6 and 7. Uh, that's what the four cups were based on. The cup of sanctification, the cup of deliverance, I brought you out, uh, the cup of redemption, and the cup of praise or hope or the kingdom, depending on where you're studying. Uh, the cup that Jesus used in the communion meal was the cup of redemption or the, some translations call it the cup of thankfulness, depending on where you're studying. But what that demonstrated, when Jesus stopped and used that cup to say, this is my blood, he was saying there is a redemption that's coming that's larger than you have any idea about, and it's received simply by believing in me. All you have to do is, is drink. All you have to do is believe and participate. And that's what he was demonstrating to say that this is how you receive the work. That cup of redemption or cup of thankfulness, that's the one that he used to say this is a new covenant that is for forgiveness of sins and for you. Uh, Paul reiterated this in 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 16 says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? So he's saying, hey, it was the cup of thanksgiving that Jesus used. And when we drink it, we're participating in receiving his life. When we eat that bread, we're receiving it. By receiving communion, we are participating or you could say activating the benefits of the blood and body of Christ that he uh, laid down for us on the cross. We're receiving benefits uh, and they only come by faith. Come on, just like everything else in the Christian life, you don't earn any of these benefits. They're coming by faith. And when we have faith, when we receive those things, when it's more than just a ritual or something we have to do, when we have faith and say, this is special, Jesus did this, uh, we are receiving the benefits of what he did for us. The body of Jesus was broken to receive and to give life to us, uh, to give us life and healing. The blood of Jesus was spilled to release forgiveness to us. Uh, uh, this was actually foreshadowed throughout scripture. One, one Old Testament verse, Psalm 103 verse 2 says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and do not forget how kind he is. Or some translations say, do not forget all his benefits. Verse 3 says, He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. Even in Psalms in the Old Testament, it was foreshadowing what we are seeing in the communion meal, that when we receive the bread, we're receiving the life, the body of Jesus for our healing. When we receive the blood, it's affirming that we are forgiven and that covenant is sealed with his blood. Uh, these benefits are often linked in scripture, forgiveness and healing. They're often linked together and they find their fulfillment in what Jesus did. Uh, so there are three main views of what actually happens 
during the communion ceremony uh, that I want to give you a little insight into. There, there are several other reviews that are a little, little bit nuanced flavors of each of these, but there are three main ones. Uh, most Protestant denominations would hold to one of these first two views. The first view is memorialism, and memorialism says the bread and the wine are purely symbolic. Uh, they are just symbols that represent Jesus He's present by faith only in the hearts and minds of the participants. So when we eat this and we drink this, we're just saying these are symbols of what Jesus did and it should cause us to remember his work. Uh, the second version of what people believe happens during uh, the communion meal that most Protestants would affirm to either number one or this one uh, is called the pneumatic presence. And pneumatic just means the spirit. Uh, pneuma is the word breath. It's used to refer to the Holy Spirit of God sometimes. So when we say pneumatic presence, something is there by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the pneumatic presence view says that the true body and blood of Jesus are received by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, but only by those who partake in faith. So, so Jesus and his work is there present when we're doing communion together, uh, but it's because the Holy Spirit is active by our believing and saying, hey, I have faith that when I do this, it's something special and I'm going to receive something from God. Uh, so that is the memorialism, the pneumatic presence. That would be the view of the majority of Protestant denominations uh, that are out there. The Catholic view of what happens during communion is a theology word called transubstantiation. And transubstantiation was established at the Fourth Council of Lateran in 1215 AD. And this view says that the bread and the wine literally become the actual body and blood of Jesus. That the bread is not bread anymore, it's the body of Christ. That the wine is not wine anymore, it's actually the blood of Jesus present in that ceremony right there. It has been transformed. Uh, there, is a, there is a separate view that's a little bit of a tangent called consubstantiation. Uh, there are a couple Protestant denominations that hold to that. It says the bread remains bread, but the physical body of Jesus is present with the bread in the receiving. Uh, so it would be consubstantiation. But the Catholic view we're talking about, transubstantiation, uh, it says there's a mystery that occurs when the priest blesses the bread and the wine. And that in that prayer and that blessing from the priest, uh, they are transformed from bread and wine into the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. Um, because they believe that Jesus is physically present, when they're doing communion, that, that those elements have been transformed. Uh, that's why you will see the priest genuflect, uh, which is bowing or crossing himself uh, when he turns towards the elements. This is an act of reverence or worship because he believes that Jesus is literally physically there. So he's genu genuflecting before the elements. He's really saying, hey, I'm, I'm worshiping Jesus because I believe he's present. Um, I think this goes beyond Jesus's admonition to remember him when we do this meal. Uh, in some aspect, the fact that Jesus's body and blood is present, part of that theology says that Jesus's sacrifice is being offered again, that it's being offered another time when we receive communion and he's physically there. Uh, they, they would even look at it as saying, hey, we're we're receiving communion and Jesus is present. His sacrifice is happening again, uh, even for dead believers who are not fully purified, that are waiting to get into heaven. Uh, they would believe that that's part of that sacrifice happening again and again. Every time they receive communion, those ele elements are transformed. Most denominations that are Protestant would re reject that view of the transubstantiation because of that aspect of Jesus' sacrifice being repeated each time or him, him being sacrificed again when communion is received. Uh, one of the verses, we'll just read one, uh, but there are several. One of the verses that says uh, why Protestants would reject that view of Jesus being offered over and over again. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 11 says, Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. 
For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Uh, this section in Hebrews and several other verses that you could read through Hebrews yourself make it clear that the work that Jesus did on the cross was a one-time event. It was so effective that for all of eternity, Jesus only had to offer himself once. And then he sat down and he's saying, hey, I'm waiting for my enemies to be made my footstool. I'm waiting for my people, my church, to enforce the victory that I secured at the cross. Jesus isn't being sacrificed over and over and over again and again. Jesus did it one time and it was so powerful. The blood of Jesus is so effective that it canceled sin. It defeated all of his enemies for all of eternity. Uh, so that is why most Protestants would reject that view of transubstantiation, not necessarily for the mystery of saying those elements are transformed, but for the aspect of saying, hey, Jesus is being offered again uh, or having to be sacrificed again during this ceremony. Uh, in addition to those three views, uh, I, I think there's still, we would, we would lean towards uh, more towards the pneumatic presence of Jesus. We're accessing his benefits by faith. It's a spiritual thing. Uh, I think scripture leaves it as a, enough of a mystery uh, that you can't reduce it to just being mere symbols, but I also don't believe in the transubstantiation that it is the literal physical body of Jesus. Uh, I think there is enough mystery though to say there is something special and unique happening here that we access by faith. Uh, in addition to those three views of what happens during communion, each denomination has a different take on who's allowed to receive communion. Uh, there are two practices regarding communion in most churches. Uh, they would fall into one of these things. Uh, the first practice is called a closed communion. And closed communion is the practice of restricting who can receive the elements uh, based on some criteria, whether it's membership or faith or some other criteria. Uh, how's your walk with Jesus going? Are you a member in good standing? Whatever it is, uh, they would call it a closed communion and say there's a certain group of people that are excluded you can't receive. Uh, the Catholic Church restricts communion to only those who are members of the Catholic Church. Uh, if you are in a Catholic ceremony and they are doing communion, they're having the Eucharist, as a non-Catholic, you would not be permitted to receive communion, uh, but non-Catholics, you can go up to the front with your arms crossed, demonstrating, hey, I can't receive, but I would like to re have a blessing from the priest. I would like him to speak over me or pray. Uh, many Protestant churches actually have some version of closed communion, uh, but they would restrict communion based on, are you a believer? Do you have faith? And maybe even do you have a clean conscience? Uh, is there sin in your life? You might hear some denominations say you need to deal with that before you come to communion. Uh, those things would make it a closed communion table. The other version is uh, called open communion. And open communion says that all people are welcome to receive regardless of their affiliation. You don't have to belong to this specific church or this belief system uh, to receive communion. Uh, at New Life Fellowship, we don't exclude anyone. We practice an open communion. Uh, but I also recognize if people don't have faith, there's no benefits that are being activated. Uh, we would not even exclude somebody that doesn't have faith, but we would recognize, hey, it you can receive it, maybe God will meet you in that moment. That would be amazing if something awakened in you when you receive communion. But if you don't have faith, there's no benefits that are happening in your life. Uh, so open communion would say everyone is welcome at the table, whether you're a member of the church or not. And even further, regardless of where you are in your walk with Jesus, you're welcome at the table. Uh, one last thing. Uh, there's a passage in scripture I want to read because Paul was giving some directions to the church in Corinth specifically around how they were doing communion. Uh, the church in Corinth, uh, they had some issues uh, of how they were conducting their worship services uh, that weren't godly or weren't in line with what Jesus wanted them to do and Paul addressed them. Uh, one of the things he addressed was how they were receiving communion. When they came together, they were having a fellowship meal or a love feast uh, which there was nothing necessarily the matter with that of taking some time in the middle of eating together as the church to say we're going to remember what Jesus did for us. But what was happening in the church of Corinth when it's time for communion, some people were eating way too much to the point of gluttony and some people were drinking so much wine that they were getting drunk while others that were there had nothing to eat and nothing to drink. And Paul said, this is not good. This is not appropriate. Uh, 
And in 1 Corinthians 11, he's giving them direction about how to actually receive communion and what you should do in the middle of that service. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 26 says, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the story, proclaiming our Lord's death until he comes. For this reason, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in the wrong spirit will be guilty of dishonoring the body and blood of the Lord. So let each individual first evaluate his own attitude and only then eat the bread and drink the cup. For continually eating and drinking in a wrong spirit will bring judgment upon yourself by not recognizing the body. This insensitivity is why many of you are weak, chronically ill, and some even dying. If we have examined ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, it is the Lord's training so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So first and foremost from that passage, communion is important because it is showing and reminding people of what Jesus did on our behalf. It's remembering his death and his sacrifice for us. Uh, if it just becomes a ritual, if we're just doing it to check off a box or because we need to do this to stay saved, we're missing the beauty of it. We're missing what Jesus wants us to do. Uh, I don't believe that it matters what we use for elements or where we do it or who administers it. That's not as important as what's going on in our heart. Am I seeing this as something special to remember my friend, my Savior? Am I seeing this as the work of Jesus and proclaiming it to everyone around me? Uh, some denominations will use those verses we just read to say that if you've committed some kind of sin, you shouldn't receive the elements today. Uh, however, the verse we read earlier, communion is the very thing that Jesus said to do to participate in his life. Uh, communion is a recognition that I couldn't be perfect, that I couldn't provide my own salvation, but he was perfect and he is the one that saves. And uh, sometimes we exclude people from the very place they need to run to, uh, to receive and be reminded, man, no matter what, I've done or who I've been, Jesus was perfect and he saved me by his work on the cross. And we, I'm remembering that in this moment of receiving communion. Uh, so I don't think Paul was saying those verses to say, don't take communion if you've got sin in your life. That should be the very time when you need to take it and remind yourself, hey, Jesus died for me to take care of these sins. Uh, Paul was referring more to how they were conducting the service. You're not being mindful of others. You're being a glutton. You're being a drunkard. All of those things in the context of a communion service were not right. And when Paul says you're doing things out of the wrong spirit, or you're, uh, some translations will say you're eating and drinking in an unworthy manner uh, and dishonoring the body and blood of Jesus, uh, that implies in the Greek that you're treating the elements as profane or common. Uh, in other words, Paul's saying the wrong spirit, dishonoring the body, not recognizing Jesus, is coming to the communion table thinking, oh, it's just another meal. It's just another little bit of bread. It's just a little sip of juice. It really doesn't mean anything. That's treating the body and blood of Jesus as profane or common. And when you do that in the wrong spirit, uh, you are not receiving or accessing the benefits that we talked about. If we don't have faith, if we don't think it's something special, then it really is just a piece of bread and a cup of juice, and you're not receiving what Jesus died to give us. Uh, and also, when it says you're bringing judgment upon yourself, if you think that that is just common, and you're, you're saying it's profane, it's, it's the body and blood of Jesus doesn't really matter that much, uh, in that moment, you're bringing the judgment upon yourself because you're saying, hey, what Jesus did doesn't really matter. It's all about me and what I'm doing. And in that case, the judgment is coming upon you. But when we examine ourselves, we see that Jesus took the judgment, that he, uh, the judgment, the decision, because that's really what that word judgment means. It's, it's a legal term that says I've arrived at a decision. The judgment we should make when we examine ourselves is that, oh, I'm in Christ. That's the decision that has been made, and I am in him and receive the benefits that he died to give me. Uh, so when we examine ourselves, we should remind ourselves he did the work because I couldn't. Uh, so the bottom line, uh, 
of our beliefs. Uh, so the Catholic Church, they exclude some people. They, they believe a transubstantiation that the body and blood of Jesus are physically present uh, when communion is received. The bottom line for our beliefs, this may not be every Protestant denomination, but it's at New Life Fellowship. Uh, these are the bottom line elements for us. We should do communion regularly because it remembers and proclaims Jesus. Uh, we shouldn't exclude people because receiving is the very thing that reminds us that we need him, that he is our savior. Uh, and while we don't believe that the elements are physically transformed into Jesus's actual blood and body, there is still some aspect of mystery that accesses spiritual benefits that we receive when we come by faith. So that is where we land on communion. That's a slight difference than where the Catholic Church lands. Uh, but I hope that clarifies it a little bit. If you've got more questions or you want to know a little bit more, please contact me. Uh, but I'd like to pray for us next session. Uh, I'm going to get into a little bit about the concept uh, in the Protestant Reformation called the priesthood of all believers and how we should approach God or how he made a way for us to approach him. Uh, so we'll talk about that next session. But let's pray. Lord Jesus, no matter what concept we've been raised with, where we've practiced communion before, or if we ever have or not, I thank you that it is something we can do that reminds us of what you've already done. Lord, I thank you that in the receiving of communion, or even in this talking about it and exploring where some of our differences are, I ask that you would remind us of your goodness, that you laid down your life for us, so that we could have a relationship with you. Just bless us, Lord, as we reflect on that. Uh, strengthen that in our hearts, in our, in our faith. Let us know that we are yours, uh, that you've saved us and you're holding us. And it was by the power of what you did on the cross, your blood and body. We just honor you now, Lord. We thank you for being with us and continue to be glorified through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. I look forward to seeing you next session. Mm -hmm.